thank you all for coming. It, it's really a great pleasure to have my first visit to this great university. And uh, so I'm sorry it's such a brief visit. But um, you'll, you'll see, though, that since I teach partly in a law school, I also have views that law, uh, the training in law should be humanistic. So I don't want to give up the side of law to the, to the other side at all. And in, in fact, Ernst Freund, who, whose name is on my chair, was a pioneer of interdisciplinary humanistic legal education who insisted that all young lawyers ought to learn philosophy. So, so that's one reason I'm glad to have that name on my chair. But I'm going to start with someone who isn't a Greek at all, but, but from India, uh, a philosopher named Rabindranath Tagore, who was a great philosopher, but better known perhaps as a poet and as a novelist and short story writer, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But he was also a great educator. And he started a school that was interdisciplinary based on the arts and humanities and a university that was called All the World University, which was itself uh, the first example in Asia of a liberal arts uh, university. And so this is what he wrote, looking back at the trends in his country. The school opened in 1905. So in 1917, right in the, in the middle of the First World War, he wrote this. History has come to a stage when the moral man, the complete man, is more and more giving way, almost without knowing it, to make room for the commercial man, the man of limited purpose. This process, aided by the wonderful progress in science, is assuming gigantic proportion and power, causing the upset of man's moral balance, obscuring his human side under the shadow of soulless organization. We are in the midst of a crisis of massive proportions and grave global consequences. And I don't mean the global economic crisis that began in the year 2008. At least then, everyone knew that a crisis was at hand, and world leaders ever since have been working quickly and desperately to find solutions. And they know well that their jobs are on the line if they don't address these problems. No, I mean a crisis that's going largely unnoticed, but one that I believe is likely to prove much more damaging in the long run to the future of democratic self-government around the world, and that is a worldwide crisis in education. Massive and radical changes are taking place in what democratic societies teach young people, and these changes have not been well thought through. Eager for national profit, nations and their systems of education are heedlessly discarding skills that are needed if democracies are to remain stable. Well, of course, these changes are that the humanities and the arts are being cut away at all levels of education, both primary, secondary, and college and university, in favor of the cultivation of a much narrower and more technical and vocational education, seen by policymakers as useless frills at a time when nations must cut away all useless things in order to stay competitive in the global market, they're rapidly losing their place in curricula and also in the minds and hearts of parents and young people. Indeed, what we might call the humanistic aspect of science, that is the imaginative creative aspect and the aspect of rigorous critical thought, has also been losing ground as nations prefer to pursue short-term profit by the cultivation of highly applied skills suitable to producing short-term profit. So consider, to just start, these two examples. First, in the fall of 2006, the United States Department of Education had a commission on the future of higher education that was headed by Bush administration Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings. And it released a report on the state of higher education in the nation called A Test of Leadership Charting the Future of U.S. Higher Education. This report did contain a valuable critique of unequal access to higher, higher education, and I think it was very important that it did that. But when it came to subject matter, it focused entirely on education for national economic growth. It concerned itself with perceived efficiencies in technology, engineering, applied science, so not even basic scientific research, but only highly applied learning. And the humanities, the arts, and critical thinking 
were just not mentioned. And by omitting them, the report strongly suggested that it would be fine to just leave those aside in favor of the cultivation of technical abilities. Second, in the fall of the year 2009 in Britain, the Labour government issued new guidelines for its research excellence framework, which assesses now all individuals and all departments in British universities. Under the new criteria, fully 25% of the mark for each individual and each department is given for what's known as impact, which is defined as narrow impact on the economic aspects of society. So, contributions to economic uh, growth and success. The humanities and the arts are forced to become pitchmen for a useful product, and they'll be able to justify their claim only if they can demonstrate a direct, short-term economic impact. Well, since that time, things have gone uh, still worse because all direct funding for the humanities has simply been cut away. Not to belabor the obvious, there are hundreds of stories like this, and new ones arrive every day. In the US, uh, unfortunately, uh, escalating a uh, number of such stories. In Europe, in India, in no doubt many other parts of the world, but those are the ones I know best, I, although East Asia is slightly different, but uh, particularly uh, Korea is an exception. Given that economic growth is so eagerly sought by all nations, too few questions are being posed in both developed and developing nations about the direction of education and with it of democratic society. With the rush to profitability in the global market, values precious for the future of democracy are in danger of getting lost. The profit motive suggests to concerned politicians that applied science and technology are of crucial importance for the future health of their nations. Now, we should have no objection to good scientific and technical education, and I'm not suggesting that nations should stop trying to improve in that regard. My concern is that other abilities, equally crucial, are in danger of getting lost in the competitive flurry. Abilities crucial to the health of any democracy internally, and also to the creation of a decent world culture and a robust type of global citizenship capable of constructively addressing the world's most pressing problems. These abilities are associated with the humanities and the arts. The ability to think critically and rigorously, the ability to transcend local loyalties and to approach world problems as what I might call a citizen of the world, and the ability to imagine sympathetically the predicament of another person. Well, I'll make my argument by pursuing the contrast that my examples have already suggested between an education for short-term profit and an education for a more inclusive type of citizenship. So to think about education for citizenship, we have to think about what democratic nations are and what they're striving for. So what does it mean then for a nation to advance, to improve its quality of life? On one very common view, it simply means to increase, increase its gross domestic product per capita. This measure of national achievement has for decades been the standard one used by development economists around the world, as if it were a good proxy for a nation's overall quality of life. The goal of a nation, says this model of development, should be economic growth. Never mind about distribution and social equality, never mind about the preconditions of stable democratic institutions, never mind about the quality of race and gender relations, Never mind about the improvement of other aspects of a human being's quality of life, such as health and education. One sign of what this model leaves out is that South Africa, under apartheid, used to shoot to the top of the development tables uh, when this model was used. There was a lot of wealth in the old South Africa, and the old model of development rewarded that achievement with good marks, ignoring the staggering distributional inequalities, the brutal apartheid regime, and the health and educational deficiencies that went with it. This model of development has been criticized for years by many serious development thinkers, but it continues to dominate a lot of policy making. Many nations are pursuing this model of development based on growth. Now, proponents of the old model sometimes like to claim that the pursuit of economic growth will by all by itself deliver those other good things that I've mentioned. Health, education, 
a decrease in social and economic <coughs> inequality, political liberty, and so on. By now, however, examining the results of divergent experiments around the world, we can see that the old model really doesn't deliver the goods as claimed. Achievements in political liberty and religious liberty are very uneasily correlated with economic growth, as the stunning success of China has by now shown all of us. But also, achievements in health and education are actually very poorly correlated with economic growth, as uh, has been discovered, for example, by studying the different Indian states, which leave health and education to be managed by the states. And so they're, they're like a, an experimental laboratory of divergent approaches. So there are states that have pursued a growth-oriented policy, where health and education have not done well, and then there are states on the other side that haven't grown well, but health and education have done well. So, so there's not that much correlation, even in that uh, area. So producing economic growth does not mean producing democracy or liberty, nor does it mean producing a healthy, engaged, educated population in which opportunities for a good life are available to all social classes. Still, everyone likes economic growth these days, and so the trend is, if anything, toward greater reliance on what I've called the old paradigm, rather than toward a more complex account of what society should be trying to achieve. What sort of education does the old model of development suggest? Education for economic growth needs basic skills, literacy and numeracy. It also needs some people to have more advanced skills in engineering, computer science, and technology. Although equal access is not terribly important. A nation can grow very nicely while the rural poor remain illiterate and without basic computer resources. As indeed recent events in many Indian states show. In states such as Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, we see the creation of economic growth through the empowerment of a technical elite who make the state attractive to foreign investors. The results of this enrichment do not trickle down to improve the health and well-being of the rural poor. So this was always the most basic problem with the GDP per capita paradigm of development. It neglects distribution, and it can reward nations or states that contain alarming inequalities. And this is particularly true of the distribution of education. Given the nature of our current information economy, nations can increase GDP without worrying too much about the distribution of education, so long as they create a competent tech and business elite. After that, education for economic growth needs perhaps a very rudimentary familiarity with history and economic fact on the part of the people who are going to go beyond elementary education in the first place. But care must be taken, lest the historical and economic narrative lead to dissent or serious critical thinking about class, about whether foreign investment is really good for the rural poor, about whether democracy can even survive when such huge inequalities in basic life chances obtain. So critical thinking would not be a very important part of education for economic growth. And there are many cases of that all around the world, but the one that I've studied most closely is the Western Indian state of Gujarat, well known for its combination of growth-oriented policies with docility and groupthink in the schools. Well, I've spoken about critical thinking and the role of history, but what about the arts? so often valued by progressive democratic educators from Tagore in India to John Dewey in the United States. An education for economic growth will first of all have contempt for those parts of a child's training because they don't seem to lead to short-term profit. For this reason all over the world, programs in arts and humanities at all levels are being cut away in favor of the cultivation of the technical. Indian parents take pride in a child who gains admission to the highly competitive institutes of technology and management. They're ashamed of a child who studies literature or philosophy or who wants to paint or dance or sing. But educators for economic growth will do more than ignore the arts. They may well fear them, for a cultivated and developed sympathy is a particularly dangerous enemy of obtuseness and obtuseness is necessary to carry out programs of growth that ignore inequality.
Speaking of education in both India and Europe, Rabindranath Tagore said, and once again back in 1917, he was that prophetic, that aggressive nationalism needs to blunt the moral conscience. So it needs people who don't really recognize the individual, who speak group speak, who behave and see the world as docile bureaucrats. Art is a great enemy of that obtuseness. And artists are never the reliable servants of any ideology, even a basically good one, because they always ask the imagination to move beyond its usual confines, to see the world in new ways. So Tagore decided to base his school and university on the arts, and it was a radical experiment. It is still that, but it's deeply unpopular today with politicians aiming at national success. So educators for economic growth are very likely to campaign against the humanities and the arts as ingredients of basic education. Interestingly, the governor of North Carolina in my country last week said that the humanities, he thought he wouldn't like to fund them, but he singled out women's studies as the particular area that he didn't want to fund. Now, you know, the critical potential of that kind of artistic and humanistic education is what he really was afraid of. Okay, so how, how else might we think of the sort of nation and the sort of citizen we're trying to build? The primary alternative to the growth-based model in international development circles, and one with which I've long uh, been associated, is known as the human development paradigm. And of course, this, this nation has been a particularly central part of the history of that paradigm. Two of the 10 meetings of the Human Development and Capability Association have taken place in this country, one in The Hague and one in Groningen, and we've had many, many uh, inputs from scholars here. Now, according to this model, what is important is what opportunities, or we call them capabilities, each person has in areas ranging from life, health, and bodily integrity to political liberty, political participation, and importantly, education. This model of development recognizes that each and every person possesses an inalienable human dignity that ought to be respected by laws and institutions. A decent nation, at a bare minimum, acknowledges that its citizens all have entitlements based on justice in these and other areas, and devises strategies to get people above a threshold level of opportunity in each. Now this model has been making surprising inroads, really, uh, given that it does ask one not to consider uh, money only. It, for example, President Sarkozy of France, when he convened a commission to study the quality of life in France and to propose a way of measuring it, Somehow or other, on that commission turned up people from the human development perspective and the report, which you can all read online, and it's an excellent report, uh, foregrounds the capabilities approach. So, uh, and, and the German Bundestag is doing a study right now, which is going along similar lines, I, I believe. Now, if a nation wants to promote that type of humane, people-sensitive democracy, one dedicated to promoting opportunities for what uh, Thomas Jefferson called in our Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to each and every person, what abilities will it need to produce in its citizens? At least the following seem crucial. First, the ability to deliberate and deliberate well about political issues affecting the nation, to examine, reflect, argue, listen, and debate, deferring neither to tradition nor to authority. Second, the ability to think about the good of the nation as a whole, not just that of one's own local group, and to see one's own nation in turn as part of a very complicated world in which issues of many kinds require intelligent transnational deliberation for their resolution. And third, the ability to have concern for the lives of others and to imagine what policy choices of many types mean for the opportunities and experiences of one's fellow citizens of many different types and for many different types of people outside one's own nation. Before we can carry that into the education domain now, we still need to understand more deeply the problems we face on the way to making young people responsible democratic citizens who might possibly implement a human development agenda. So what is it about human life that makes it so hard 
to sustain egalitarian democratic institutions and so easy to lapse into hierarchies of various types or even worse, projects of violent group animosity as a powerful group attempts to establish its supremacy. Whatever these forces are, it's ultimately against them that true education for human development must fight. So it must, as I would put it following Gandhi, engage with the clash of civilizations within each person as respect for others fights against narcissistic aggression. The internal clash can be found in all modern societies in different forms, since all contain struggles over inclusion and equality, whether the precise locus of these struggles is in debates about immigration or the accommodation of religious, racial, and ethnic minorities, or gender equality or affirmative action. In all societies, too, there are forces in the human personality that militate against mutual recognition and reciprocity, as well as forces of compassion and respect that give egalitarian democracy strong support. So what then do we know by now about the forces in the personality that militate against democratic reciprocity and respect? First, we know that people have a high level of deference to authority. Psychologist Stanley Milgram, in famous and much uh, replicated experiments, showed that experimental subjects were willing to administer what they took to be a very painful and debilitating level of electric shock to another human being, so long as the superintending scientist told them to go ahead, said things like, it's all right, or even, you must go on. And even when the other person who of course was paid by the experimenter, was screaming in pain, which of course was, was faked for the sake of the experiment. Solomon Ash, another great psychologist, showed even earlier that human beings have an alarming level of deference to peer pressure. His experimental subjects were willing to go against the clear evidence of their senses when all the other people around them were making sensory judgments that were off target. What he typically did was to have a very simple perceptual question like, is line A longer or is line B longer or are lines A and B parallel or not, where the answer was very clear. And then he would stage it so that people who were sitting there with the experimental subject would give the wrong answer. And he found that there had to be at least six who would give the wrong answer first. But if there were at least six who gave the wrong answer, and no one said anything else, then the experimental subject, in an alarmingly high number of cases, gave also the wrong answer. And interviewed afterwards, they'd say things like, well, you know, I thought it looked the other way, but you know, those other people said it, and so I, I just didn't know, you know. Or even worse, they would say, I knew that it wasn't that way, but I was ashamed to say it. So, all right, both Milgram's work and Ash's have been used very effectively by historian Christopher Browning to illuminate the behavior of young Germans in a police battalion that murdered Jews during the Nazi era. So great was the influence of both authority and peer pressure on those young men that the ones who couldn't bring themselves to shoot the Jews confessed in letters and diaries that they felt shame at their weakness. Still other research demonstrates that apparently normal people are willing to engage in behavior that humiliates and stigmatizes if their situation is set up in a particular way, casting them in a dominant role and telling them that others are their inferiors. One particularly chilling example involves uh, school children in the US whose teacher informs them one day that children with blue eyes are superior to children with brown eyes. And these are children of around eight years old. And immediately, the blue-eyed group starts bullying and humiliating the brown-eyed group. But still worse, the next day, the teacher comes in and says, oh, terribly sorry, I got it the wrong way around. It's actually <laughs> children with brown eyes are superior, children with blue eyes are inferior. And would you think that the brown-eyed ones would have learned something from the experience of being bullied? No, they just flip and they start bullying in their turn. <laughs> 
Perhaps the most chilling experiment of this type is Philip Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment, in which he showed that experimental subjects randomly assigned the roles of prisoner and prison guard start behaving differently almost immediately. The prisoners lapsed into passivity and depression. The guards used their position to humiliate and stigmatize. Other research on disgust, which I've been particularly interested in and, and on which I, I drew in, in a book on that topic, shows that people are very uncomfortable with the signs of their own animality and mortality. Disgust is the emotion that polices the boundary between ourselves and the other animals. In virtually all societies, however, it's not enough to keep ourselves free from contamination by bodily waste products that are, in the language of the psychologists who study this, animal reminders. Instead, people create subordinate groups of human beings who are the, unto whom these properties, these animal properties, are then projected and who are then identified as disgusting and contaminating because they're dirty, smelly, bearers of disease, and so on. And there's a lot of work done on how such attitudes figure in the history of anti-Semitism, in racism directed against African Americans in the US with its um, avoidance of shared lunch counters, shared drinking fountains, shared swimming pools, and most recently in uh, US uh, violence and stigmatization of gays and lesbians. So what else do we know? We know that all these forces take on much more power when people are anonymous or are not held personally accountable. People act much worse under the shelter of anonymity as part of a faceless mass than they do when they are examined and watched as individuals. You can see this from a lot of internet behavior, and I'm sure you're very familiar with the role that anonymity plays in bullying there. Second, people behave worse when not one person raises a critical voice. Ash's subjects went along with the false judgment when not one of the six people before that said the right thing. But he found that if even one said the right thing, that completely changed the situation. Then the experimental subject was confident and went ahead and said what, what he or she really believed. Third, people behave worse when the human beings over whom they have power are dehumanized and de-individualized. In a wide range of situations, people behave much worse when the other is portrayed as like a, a thing or an animal or as bearing only a number rather than a name. So in thinking how we might help individuals and societies to win the internal clash of civilizations, we would do well to think about how these tendencies can be used to our advantage. The other side of the internal clash is the child's growing capacity for compassionate concern and for fairness, for seeing another person as an end and not a mere means. Now, very fundamental research by Yale psychologist Paul Bloom, some of which is just about to be released in a great book called Just Babies, shows that not only is perspectival thinking, that is the ability to see the world from somebody else's point of view, present in children as young as one year old, so too, is the idea of fairness. Uh, he, very interesting how he manages to test this, and the book goes into a lot of detail about that. But anyway, children are averse to the sight of behavior that they perceive as unfair. So that's there. It's a resource to be drawn on, but of course it's very narrow. And how do children use these things? They typically use their mental abilities when they're young to get what they want from their parents. But then, it, it, as Bloom says, all the rest is culture. So we have the rest, to, to develop it well and broaden it is the job of education. As time goes on, if all goes well, children will come to feel gratitude and love toward the separate beings who support their needs and to therefore inhibit their own aggression. And as concern for others develops, it leads to an increasing wish to control one's own aggression in the name of fairness. The child recognizes that other people are separate people with rights of their own. Such recognitions are typically unstable, since human life is a chancy business, and we all feel the anxieties that lead us to want more control, especially control over other people. But a good development in the family and a good education later on that builds on that 
can make a child feel genuine compassion for the needs of others and a desire to be fair to them, whoever they are. But now that we have a sense of the terrain on which education goes to work, we can return to the ideas I mentioned earlier, saying some things quite sketchy, of course, but still, I think, radical in the present world culture concerning the abilities that a good education will cultivate. So three values, I've mentioned them before, I think are really crucial to decent global citizenship. The first is the capacity for Socratic self-criticism and critical thought about one's own traditions. As Socrates argues in the Platonic Dialogues, democracy needs citizens who can think for themselves rather than deferring to authority. He did not need Milgram to observe that uh, propensity who can reason together about their choices rather than simply trading claims and counter claims. He compared himself to the, a gadfly, a fly who, with a painful sting, on the back of the democracy, which he then compared to a noble but sluggish horse. So what he was saying was democracy is basically noble, but it has to be kept awake and you have to keep stinging it if it's going to do its business well. Critical thinking of the Socratic type is particularly crucial for good citizenship in any society that needs to come to grips with the presence of people who differ by ethnicity, caste, or religion. We will only have a chance at an adequate dialogue across those difficult boundaries if young people know how to engage in dialogue and deliberation at all in the first place. And they will only know how to do that if they do learn how to examine themselves and to think about the reasons why they're inclined to support one thing rather than another. Rather than, as so often happens in every uh, democracy, starting with ancient Athens, seeing political debate as simply a way of boasting or scoring points for your own side or humiliating the adversary or whatever. When politicians bring simplistic propaganda their way, as politicians in every country and time have a way of doing, young people will only have a hope of preserving independence and holding the politicians accountable if they know how to think critically about what they hear, testing its logic and imagining alternatives to it. Students exposed to instruction in critical thinking and rigorous debate learn at the same time a new attitude to those who disagree with them. They learn to see people who disagree not as looming opponents like an opposing sports team that you just have to defeat, but instead as people who have reasons for what they think. When their arguments are reconstructed, it may turn out that they even share some important premises with one's own side. And then both will understand better where the differences come from, and then be able to progress from there. And we can see how this humanizes the political other, making the mind see that opposing form as a rational being who may share at least some thoughts with one's own group. A student that I once interviewed in the US, he was in a business college in Boston, and I met him because he was uh, working at the uh, check-in desk at my gym, and I saw as I came in that he was reading Plato's Apology and Crito, and I thought, this is interesting, and I'd like to know what, why he's reading it and, and what he thinks about it and so on. So I started to get to know him, and I interviewed him over a whole period of a year while he was taking a required philosophy course. All the students in this business college were, were, had certain liberal arts requirements and they were doing some philosophy. So what he did, he first told me that the image of Socrates was riveting to him. The very idea that somebody would die for the sake of an argument was really fascinating and then drew him in. But then as the course went on, it moved into contemporary issues. So having dissected the arguments in a platonic dialogue, they then put this to work by having debates about issues of the day. And he found that he was asked to take the negative side, the side against the death penalty in a classroom debate, even though he actually favors the death penalty. He said it was the first time in his life that he'd ever had the idea, I think this is falling off my ear, let me just fix it a minute, um, that he'd ever had the idea that you could produce arguments for a position that you don't hold yourself. Now think about that, a very bright and talented 19 year old in the United States, and he had not had that idea from his upbringing. And I think that speaks very ill of our political culture, our media, and so on. It's not that surprising. But anyway, it's an important idea to get. And he said it changed his attitude toward political debate henceforth. 
The idea that one will take responsibility for one's own reasoning and exchange ideas with others in an atmosphere of mutual respect for reason is essential to the peaceful resolution of differences, both within a nation and in a world increasingly polarized by ethnic and religious conflict. It's possible, and in fact essential, to encourage critical thinking from the very beginning of a child's education. That was a big part of Tagore's school, in fact. It was very inspired by Socrates, so too John Dewey's schools in the United States. And uh, indeed, I know that a lot of experiments along this line are being carried out in this country in the primary schools. Critical thinking, however, can become more sophisticated and richer at the college and university level, where I mean, I've argued that mandatory courses in philosophy that it, it teach you how to do this with issues of the day really should be a part of higher education for everyone in order to produce respectful and rigorous debate. Critical thinking is, of course, a content that can be part of a school's curriculum, but it won't be well taught unless it also informs the spirit of a school or university's pedagogy. So the Students have to be treated as active people whose powers of mind are unfolding and who are expected to make creative and active contributions to the discussion. Well, let's now consider the relevance of this ability to the current problem of modern pluralistic democracies surrounded by a powerful global marketplace. First of all, we can now say that even if we were just aiming at economic growth, Leading business thinkers understand by now very well the importance of creating workplace cultures in which critical voices are not silenced, cultures of both individuality and accountability. In fact, you can do this, you can see leading instances of failure in things like our uh, US uh, space program, the failure of the space shuttle Challenger, to a workplace in which people were afraid to speak up and criticize what was going on. And interestingly, Singapore and China, who certainly do not wish to produce democracy, still understand the role of dissent and critical thinking in the workplace, and for that reason, they've greatly increased the amount of critical thinking and what they call active learning in, in the schools. But our goal, I've said, is not simply economic growth, so let me now turn to political culture. As I've said, human beings are prone to be subservient to both authority and peer pressure. To prevent atrocity, we need to counteract those tendencies, producing cultures of vigorous dissent. Ash, remember, found that when just one person spoke up, things changed. So by emphasizing each person's active voice, we promote accountability. When people see their ideas as their own responsibility, they're more likely, too, to see their deeds as their own responsibility. But now to the second ability. The second key ability of modern democratic citizens, I would argue, is the ability to see yourself as what the ancient uh, Greek and Roman Stoics called a citizen of the whole world. That is, not just a member of a narrow group, but the mem a member of a heterogeneous nation, and then in turn of a much more complicated world, understanding something of the history and character of the different groups that inhabit it. Knowledge is no guarantee of good behavior, but ignorance is a virtual guarantee of bad behavior. Simple cultural and religious stereotypes are everywhere in our world. For example, the facile equation of Islam with terrorism. And the first way to begin combating these is to make sure that from a very early age, students learn a different relationship to the world. They should gradually come to understand both the differences that make understanding difficult between groups and nations and shared human needs and strivings that make understanding possible and indeed essential if common problems are to be solved. This understanding of the world will promote human development only if it is itself infused by searching critical thinking. So what I have in mind is not history spoon-fed and taught by rote, but history taught with an eye to thinking critically about how a historical novel, how a historical narrative is constructed, how differences of power play a role and who gets to tell the story, and all of those things. In curricular terms, these ideas suggest that all young citizens should learn the rudiments of world history with increasing sophistication as they grow up, 
and should also get a rich and non-stereotypical understanding of the major world religions, and then should learn how to inquire in greater depth into at least one unfamiliar tradition, in this way acquiring tools and questions and a knowledge of their own ignorance that can later be used elsewhere. At the same time, they must learn about the major traditions, minority and majority, within their own nation, understanding how differences of religion, race, gender, sexuality have been associated with different life opportunities. And all, I believe, although I hardly have to say it here, I think clearly, uh, should learn at least one foreign language well. <laughs> Seeing that another group is, uh, has cut up the world differently, that all translation is a kind of stammering interpretation, and this is something that most Americans never quite get, uh, gives a young person an essential lesson in cultural humility. The third ability of the citizen, closely related to the first two, is what I would call the narrative imagination. This means the ability to think what it might be like to be in the shoes of a person, indeed many different types of people, different from oneself to be an intelligent reader of that person's story, and to understand the emotions, wishes, and desires that someone so placed might have. The cult this is falling off on the other side now, wait a second. Okay. <laughs> the cultivation of sympathy has been a key part of the best modern ideas of progressive education, including those of Tagore, Dewey, Maria Montessori, who went to study with Tagore, and so on, for good reason. The moral imagination, always under siege from fear and narcissism, is apt to become obtuse, if not energetically refined and cultivated through the development, the increasingly sophisticated development of sympathy and concern. Learning to see another human being, not as a thing, but as a full person, is not an automatic achievement. It is based on innate equipment, but it must be promoted and refined by an education that develops the ability to think about what inner lives of others might be like, but also to understand why one can never fully grasp that inner world, why any person is always, to a certain extent, dark to any other, including the self to the self. The arts can cultivate student sympathy in many ways through engagement with many different works of literature, music, fine art, and dance. Dance was at the core of Tagore's curriculum because of the problem that he identified, namely that women were ashamed of their bodies and were unwilling to move freely and that, that impeded their social equality. But anyway, so you choose in, in terms of what the blind spots of your own culture are. So in general, thought must be given to what the student and the society particularly needs to learn and texts should be chosen in consequence. For all societies at all times have their own particular blind spots, groups within their culture and also groups abroad that are especially likely to be dealt with ignorantly and obtusely. Works of art can be chosen to promote criticism of this obtuseness and a more adequate vision of the unseen. Ralph Ellison, the great African-American novelist, in a later preface that he attached to his wonderful novel, Invisible Man, wrote that a novel like his could be a raft of perception, entertainment, and hope on which America could negotiate the snags and whirlpools that stand between it and the democratic ideal. And of course, that's a pregnant statement because the raft refers back to Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, the first famous novel about race relations in, in America. Uh, and, uh, but he's saying that the entertainment goes with the perception and the hope. It's in the middle, as it were. The entertainment is the bridge that allows people to move into that hope. Now, how, how could that be true? Well, Invisible Man, of course, takes the, what he calls the inner eyes of the white reader as both its subject matter and its target. The novel begins with the sentence, I am an invisible man. And then the character, who's a young African-American man, goes on to say, this invisibility is not the result of a chemical accident to my epidermis. It is the result of a certain deficiency in the inner eyes of those who come in contact with me. Those eyes, he then goes on to say, that they use to look through their physical eyes on reality. So 
the imagination is obtuse. And so all through the novel, you see that people project onto him as though he was just a screen, various desires, fantasies, stigma, prejudice. And it doesn't have anything to do with really learning about him or coming to see him. So what, um, what Ellison is trying to say is that through the imagination, we may, if we work hard, be able to grasp toward the, across the snags and whirlpools, a kind of insight into the lives of another group or person that's very difficult to attain in daily life, particularly when our world has constructed sharp separations between groups and suspicions that make any encounter difficult. To see how crucial the arts can be in supplying ingredients for democratic citizenship in cultures divided by ethnicity and class, let me now introduce an example from my own home city, and that is the Chicago Children's Choir. It's high school age, but I think it, uh, it has morals that you can think about for universities as well. Now, Chicago contains huge economic inequalities, which translate into large differences in basic housing, employment opportunities, and educational quality. African-American and Latino neighborhoods in particular are likely not to give children anywhere near as good an education as children get in urban private schools or suburban white neighborhoods. Such children may already have disadvantages. They may have only one parent or even no parents living at home. They may have gang, gangs operating in their neighborhood. <laughs> They may have no or few role models of career success, discipline, aspiration, or political engagement. Schools are largely segregated by just housing, I mean, de facto. So students are likely to have few friends from classes and races different from their own. To make things worse, the arts, which might bring children together in non-hierarchical ways, have been very severely cut back in the public schools as part of cost-cutting measures introduced by Arne Duncan, the very man who's now the US Secretary of Education in the Obama administration. Uh, things are getting better recently, and I'll talk about that later if there's time. Into this void has stepped the Chicago Children's Choir, an organization currently supported by private philanthropy, which by now includes around 4,000 children, approximately 80% below the poverty line, in programs of choral singing with rigorous standards of excellence. The program has three tiers. First, there are the school programs, and these are the ones that just replace the cut music programs, and they serve 2,500 students in more than 60 different choirs in 50 elementary schools, focusing on grades three through eight, in other words, ages eight through 13. The in-school program is the fundamental starting point, but then the second tier is volunteer, and it consists of neighborhood choirs, six different choirs in different regions of Chicago. So these are after-school programs requiring a level of commitment. You have to attend rehearsals regularly, but you don't need to be particularly talented. And the children in those are ages eight to 16. These children perform several times a year, and importantly, they tour to different parts of the country. Children learn a wide range of music from different countries of the world, and they develop their musical skills. Finally, the most advanced level, the concert choir, which is picked by audition from the neighborhood choirs, is probably the top youth choir in the United States today. It's recorded numerous CDs, it's toured internationally, and it's performed with symphony orchestras and opera companies. This group performs works ranging from Western classical music to African-American spirituals to Korean, Indian music, and so on. The repertory deliberately takes them into many different world cultures. Such facts are easy to narrate, but what's difficult to describe is the emotional impact of hearing these young people who don't sing like the church choirs of my youth, just standing up there holding your music and immobile. They memorize and they act everything that they sing and their faces in, have great joy in the act of singing. I've observed rehearsals of the Hyde Park neighborhood choir near where I live as well as many public performances by that choir and the concert choir, 
And at all levels, one finds immense pride, musical aspiration, and personal commitment. Singers from the concert choir typically are urged to become mentors to the younger children, giving the younger children role models of discipline and possibility, and then giving the older children an ethos of social responsibility. When I recently interviewed Molly Stone, who's conductor of the Hyde Park Neighborhood Choir and associate conductor of the concert choir, I asked her what, in her view, the choir contributes to democratic life in Chicago. You know, and she doesn't, she's never read any of my work. So, so it was kind of, I was really asking her cold. And she gave me a really interesting set of answers. First, she said, the choir gives children the opportunity for an intense experience side by side with ch children from different racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. The experience of singing with someone, she said, includes great vulnerability. You have to be willing to blend your breath with, and your body with someone else's. And you have to make the sounds from inside your own body, as would not exactly be the case so much, even with an orchestra. So, in addition, the musical experience teaches children love of their own bodies at an age when they're likely to hate their bodies and feel very uncomfortable. So they develop a sense of ability, discipline, and responsibility. Then, since the choirs sing music for many different cultures, they learn about those cultures, and they learn that these cultures are available to them. They transcend barriers that expectation and stereotype have thrown in their way, showing that they can go into the world. By learning to sing the music of another time or place, they also find ways of showing that they respect someone else, that they're willing to spend time learning about them and taking them seriously. In all these ways, she said, they learn about their role in the local community and the world, and she emphasized that this can lead to many forms of curiosity, as choir alums usually don't become professional singers. They go on to study history or political science or language or visual art or, or whatever. Three stories illustrate what she's talking about. So she, she said, um, one day, she came into the rehearsal room of the concert choir, and she saw three African-American girls singing a passage of a Bach motet that they'd been rehearsing in choir. And she said to them, oh, so you're getting in some extra rehearsal time, huh? And the girls said, no, oh, we're just chilling. <laughs> and that was so interesting, because the way they saw it, they were relaxing with their friends, they were chilling. And that the, these African-American women from a very poor so-called ghetto background would feel that comfortable with Bach was really, you know, and they didn't feel that they had to be stuck with black culture. They could claim any culture as their own and take membership of it. It was their own as much as the world of the African-American spiritual. Stone then remembered her own experience as a child in a neighborhood choir that was predominantly African-American, and she was the only Jewish person and one of the very few white people, when the choir started to learn a Hebrew folk song. So she said, well, she suddenly felt that people who she thought might not like her were actually interested in taking her seriously and learning about her. And then finally, the third story she told, on a recent tour, the Hyde Park Choir went to Nashville, Tennessee, which is the home of country music and the Grand Old Opry, but it's a place whose culture and values are likely to be very different from those of inner city Chicago, and there's likely to be, and certainly is, a great deal of mistrust on both sides, religious, ethnic, racial, and so on. Hearing a country music group performing outside the Grand Old Opry, the kids recognized a country song that they had been learning in choir, and they surrounded the band and joined in. A celebratory expression of mutual respect was the result. Well, I've mentioned here only the contribution the choir makes to the young people. Needless to say, this contribution is multiplied many times through the effect on parents and families, on the schools, on audiences, and uh, so on. Unfortunately, such enterprises are not favored by the U.S. education establishment, local or national, so the choir continues to struggle and to need voluntary contributions. So the good thing that's happened recently, though, is we have a mayor, Rahm Emanuel, who was in the Obama administration, but it turns out he doesn't share the narrow technocratic values of that administration. He was an, 
a ballet major at Sarah Lawrence College, which is a very arts-oriented college, and for a time he was a professional ballet dancer. And he's actually remembered that rather than repudiating it. And he's created a program with the guidance of Yo-Yo Ma and Rene Fleming to bring two hours of arts education every day into the schools. It still needs to be funded. He's working on that and so on. But I think it's a tremendous, wonderful commitment and uh, you know, way, a way of uh, relieving the choir of some of the burden it faces as a volunteer organization. So let's take stock. How are the abilities of citizenship doing in the world today? Pretty poorly, I fear. Education of the type I recommend is doing reasonably well in the place where I first studied it, namely the liberal arts portion of US, and, uh, US college and university curricula. And in fact, that part, although there are constant noises made by governors about reducing it, it still really does remain quite healthy. Now, however, we still do have to worry because in the New York Times, Harvard's president, Drew Faust, reports that even at that very rich private institution, the economic downturn has reinforced a picture that the value of a university degree is largely instrumental. And therefore, she herself is increasingly pushed into embracing a market model of her mission. I haven't heard that nearly so much in my own university, but it, it certainly, it, it's uneven, but, it, but it's certainly everywhere. There are possibilities of that sort of pressure. Outside the US, many nations whose university curricula do not include a liberal arts component are now striving to build one since they acknowledge its importance in crafting a public response to the problems of pluralism, fear, and suspicion their societies face. I've been involved in such discussions in many nations, but I've been particularly interested in the experiments here in Rotterdam, in Utrecht, and in Leiden. Uh, in fact, I just came from The Hague where I was on a panel with a young faculty member in the liberal arts uh, curriculum in, in Leiden, and it's very, very heartening to hear about that. Now, this is a, a difficult thing, though, because teaching of the sort that I'm thinking about needs small classes. In fact, in Leiden, they cap it at 20. And, uh, but of course, that means not all students in the current way things are done could, could be in that. And so um, we have to think about how, how to do that. And often, politicians are not willing to believe that that's that important, that they would fund that number of faculty positions. But you do need small classes, or at least sections in larger classes, where students get copious feedback on frequent writing assignments. So the universities of the world have great merits, but also great and increasing problems. By contrast, the abilities of citizenship are doing quite poorly in every nation in the most critical years of children's lives, the years that we call K through 12, so kindergarten through, through high school. Here, the demands of the global market make everyone focus on the scientific and technical abilities, not, again, basic science, but highly applied abilities, as the key thing, and the humanities and arts and history are increasingly perceived as useless frills, which we could prune away to make sure our nation remains competitive. To the extent that they are the focus of national discussion, they're recast as technical abilities themselves to be tested by quantitative multiple choice examinations. And the imaginative and critical abilities that lie at their core are left aside. In the US, national testing under our No Child Left Behind Act has made things worse as national testing uh, can easily do, for at least my first and third ability are not testable by quantitative multiple choice exams. They can be assessed, but not, not, not that way. And the second is very poorly tested in that way. Moreover, it's not even included. So history teachers are being fired all over the US because there's no history test in the No Child Left Behind. Whether a nation is aspiring to a greater share of the market like the US, uh, or uh, just struggling to stay where it is, the imagination and the critical faculties look like useless paraphernalia, and people even uh, start to have contempt for them. What will we have if these trends continue? Nations of technically trained people who don't know how to criticize authority or listen to one another with respect, useful profit makers with obtuse imaginations. Indeed, when we consider, as I have for some time, the Indian state of Gujarat, which has for a particularly long time gone down that road with no critical thinking in the schools and a concerted focus on technical ability, one can see clearly 
how a band of docile engineers could be welded into a murderous force to enact the most horrendously racist and anti-democratic policies, such as that state slaughter of more than 2,000 Muslim civilians in 2002. A very good example of submissiveness to both authority and peer pressure, because they were egged on by officials of the state government who by now have been convicted in court. So how can we avoid going down that road? Democracies have great rational and imaginative potential. They're also prone to some serious flaws in reasoning, to parochialism, haste, sloppiness, selfishness, but far worse, this deference to authority. Education based mainly on profitability in the global market magnifies these deficiencies, producing a greedy obtuseness and a technically proficient docility that threaten the very life of democracy itself and that certainly impede the creation of a decent world culture. If the real clash of civilizations is, as I believe, a clash within each individual person, as greed and narcissism contend against respect and love, all modern societies are rapidly losing the battle as they feed the forces that lead to dehumanization and fail to feed the forces that lead to cultures of equality and concern. If we do not insist on the crucial importance of the humanities and the arts, they will drop away because they don't deliver short-term economic profit. They only do what is much more precious than that, make a world that is worth living in, people who are able to see other human beings as full people with thoughts and feelings of their own that deserve respect and sympathy, and nations that are able to overcome fear and suspicion in favor of sympathetic and reasoned debate. Thanks. <laughs>